I'm Dr. John Iskander. Welcome to CDC Beyond the Data. I'm here today with Dr. Rachel Rogers, environmental health scientist at CDC ATSDR. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Rogers. Thank you for having me. Uh, so today's public health grand round session was about PFAS. What are PFAS and what is the nature of the public health concern? Sure, so PFAS are per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. It's quite a mouthful. We typically just refer to them by the acronym PFAS. And they are a large class of chemicals. We think at this point more than 5,000 potentially. They're characterized, chemicals in the class are characterized by a long carbon chain that's either partially or fully fluorinated. So where there would be a hydrogen bond and instead you have a fluorine atom, um, the carbon fluorine bond is one of the strongest in organic chemistry. And as a result of that, PFAS tend to be incredibly environmentally persistent and also persistent in humans. And so this has come to the attention of the public health community because when PFAS are released into the environment, they tend to stay there. And as a consequence of that, we are finding them in drinking water supplies, also um, in some consumer products, as well as some food sources. So you just mentioned several possible ways that, that humans could be exposed to PFAS. What are the major routes of exposure? So the primary pathway of human exposure is ingestion. Uh, we know that there are people who have been exposed to PFAS in their drinking water. Uh, we also have evidence of PFAS in certain food products, food, foods that are grown or raised in areas with PFAS contamination um, may contain PFAS and, and people may be exposed uh, through the consumption of those items. Um, we also know that there may be PFAS in some consumer products. So um, we have known for a, about 20 years now through one of, one of CDC systems, the, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, that there are measurable levels of these chemicals in, in, our, in our bloodstreams. Um, what have we learned about some of the human health effects and what do we still need to learn? That's right. So since uh, the early 2000s, say 1999, 2000, we have been able to measure PFAS in the blood of the general U.S. population. Uh, what we've learned through that work is that most people in the United States have been exposed to PFAS and, and have some level of PFAS in their blood. Um, now, I will note that the uh, data is suggesting a decline in serum concentrations, blood concentrations of PFAS over time. So we've seen uh, levels of PFOA and PFOS, two specific species, go down since 1999, uh, but, but we do still find them in the blood of the U.S. population. Um, there is a growing body of scientific information about the potential for adverse health effects resulting from exposure to PFAS. Um, some but not all studies suggest that PFAS have the potential to affect many different body systems. Um, in particular, we have evidence that PFAS may uh, be associated with an increase in cholesterol levels. There may also be some impact on the immune system, and there may be an association with certain types of cancers. Okay. And y yes, I would encourage people to uh, watch, watch the full ground, grand rounds for the, uh, the, the details on that. Um, and, and so health studies of the health effects of PFAS are, are, are ongoing. Um, in the interim, what are some of the things, actions taken on the state level? We heard, from, for example, today from the state of Michigan. What kinds of public health actions uh, can be uh, taken um, if you know about PFAS exposure? Absolutely. So I, I think CDC places a great priority on identifying where exposure is occurring, assessing it, and then evaluating the potential public health impacts of those exposures. We have a number of efforts underway to uh, accomplish those goals, but there is quite a lot going on at the state level that's very much in alignment with those efforts. Um, 
As we saw in the Grand Rounds, there are several statewide surveillance efforts underway to, to really measure PFAS in drinking water supplies in order to identify places where people are being exposed. That's really the first step. Um, we need to know where people are being exposed in order to evaluate the public health impact of that exposure and to stop it. Uh, and I know Michigan is is doing some things which I think are are are, are um, going a little bit beyond that. I know they've put up some advisories for fishers and hunters in some uh, in some locations. Um, we also heard today a very powerful story of a of a community advocate. What what actions can communities take as like so many communities as they learn that they have been exposed to these chemicals? Absolutely. I think the presentation that we saw today really highlights the importance of community involvement and community engagement. Uh, more and more every day we are identifying new communities that are grappling with concerns about PFAS contamination and, and concerns about exposure to PFAS. And what we see is that community engagement uh, is critical to our ability to address the concerns and to solve these problems and to get the information that we need to really get ahead of this public health concern. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the ways, uh, scientifically and otherwise, that CDC is collaborating with some of these communities? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Uh, we have quite a few projects going on right now. Uh, CDC is engaged with over 40 communities across the United States in some way or another. Uh, we are, are working on public health assessments. We also have a couple of really exciting projects that are just getting off the ground. We're conducting exposure assessments in a handful of communities across the United States um, that are located near current or former military bases and that have had demonstrated PFAS contamination in the drinking water. Uh, we also are just launching a multi-site health study that we'll be conducting through cooperative agreements with external partners at the state level also academic institutions, nonprofits, um, and that project is an effort to really build what we know about the association between exposure to PFAS and the potential for adverse health effects in humans. And so both of those projects, as well as um, really all of our ongoing work, uh, relies very heavily on partnerships with the state, uh, with academics, with the communities, with um, just a very broad range of external partners. It really is a team effort. So that's, again, uh, sounds like there will be a lot of um, scientific and, and health information coming and, and maybe just as importantly, uh, helping communities feel, uh, feel, feel supported and feel like they have uh, the power to, to, to do something. Absolutely. Um, I will ask you now a question which many people have asked me when they hear about this month's topic, and that is, what can they do on the individual level to reduce their risk of exposure? For example, should they get rid of all their nonstick cookware? Sure, that's, that's a question that we get all the time. Um, the good news is that there have been quite a few efforts to reduce the use of these chemicals in consumer products. So um, the two species I mentioned earlier, PFOA and PFOS, uh, those chemicals have largely been phased out of use and production in the United States. Uh, that's, that's not to say it's 100%, um, but we are seeing that exposure to those specific what we call legacy species through the use of consumer products like nonstick cookware um, is really on the decline. That said, there are new PFAS being developed every day. Um, and so there is still some potential that there may be PFAS that we don't know as much about um, in some of these consumer products. So I think being informed consumers uh, is generally a good idea uh, because of concerns about PFAS exposure, but also lots of other things as well. So um, reading labels, paying attention to the emerging scientific information on the topic, that's always a good idea. Yeah. 
And as a, as a physician, one of my take homes from this session was that individual, people concerned about individual health, is PFAS affecting my health, that probably one of the best pieces of advice to give them is to regularly see their physician, get recommended preventive health screenings. Um, is, is there anything you would, you would kind of add to that general, general health guidance? So I think that's an incredibly important point. Many of the health effects that we see associations with PFAS exposure are things that physicians are doing some screening for already. Um, so it is incredibly important that people follow recommendations for standard care. They uh, get their annual physicals, that pregnant women get prenatal care. Um, that's incredibly important. It's also important that people pay attention to any symptoms they might be experiencing and communicate with their physicians about those symptoms. At this time, there are no recommendations for specific medical screenings um, as a result of potential for PFAS exposure, but that's, that's true for asymptomatic individuals. For people experiencing symptoms, there, there may be things that clinicians can do. So it's very important that people pay attention um, to the symptoms that yeah. they're experiencing and, and be talking to their physicians. Yeah. So I, I think that's a, it's a good note to end on, is thinking of both actions individuals can take, uh, actions communities can take, and as we move f uh, further up to states, uh, lo lots of things that can be, uh, lots of public health and preventive actions that can be taken. Thank you very much, Dr. Rogers. You're very welcome. Thank you for watching Beyond the Data. Uh, additional Beyond the Data episodes are available on the Public Health Grand Rounds website, and please join us in January 2020 for our new podcast series. Thank you. Thank you.